Hi everyone, thank you for joining us for worship today. Later we're going to hear a word from Pete Milner, but I'm going to start us off by reading a poem by Christina Rossetti called Good Friday. Am I a stone and not a sheep that I can stand, O Christ, beneath thy cross to number drop by drop thy blood's slow loss and yet not weep? Not so those women loved who with exceeding grief lamented thee. Not so fallen Peter, weeping bitterly. Not so the thief was moved. Not so the sun and moon, which hid their faces in the starless sky, a horror of great darkness at broad noon. I, only I, yet give not o'er, but seek thy sheep, true shepherd of the flock. Greater than Moses, turn and look once more, and smite a rock. So here in this poem, Rosetti is saying that she is she can't believe herself that she could look on the cross of Christ and, and somehow not be moved in her heart by it. And so she's asking God to, to allow the Spirit to move on her, to give her a right heart that can really comprehend and appreciate and receive what Jesus has done. And I think this week, this month, this year, that we've had a lot of things begging for our attention. And Lent and Easter season has kind of become thrown in with everything that's going on in the world. And so somehow I think we can be a bit distracted or our hearts can be a bit hard. or We can forget the, um, the enormity of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So I just want us to begin worship by praying that the Holy Spirit would move on us to soften our hearts, to give us a real appreciation for what Jesus has done for us, to help us remember what we were when he called us, what he's delivered us from. And I know that he will do that because in Romans, it says that God loves us and that he has given the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And so, Father, I just ask that you would come into every household and that your spirit would rest on all of us, Father that you would move on our hearts and soften us and help us to call to mind again um, what you've done for us, what Jesus has done for us, his suffering and his death, um, and, but his love, God, his love for us. And Father, we just pray that you would just speak to us and just draw us um, close to you, that you would open the eyes of our hearts to really see and appreciate all that Jesus has delivered us from, his faithfulness to us, and his love for us, Father. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise and 
such a sweet fellowship with our family, as sons and daughters. Let's sing with me. Great, what have you done? You murdered me on that cross. Accused and absence all along. My sin washed away in your too much to make sense of it all I know that your love breaks the fall The 
The scandal of grace You died in my place So my soul will it Oh, to be like you Give all I have just to know Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in Power is as dead as my sin. The cross has taught me to live. Mercy, my heart now to sing. The day and its trouble shall come. I know that your strength is enough. The scandal of grace. Died in my place, so my soul will live. Oh, to be like you, give all I have just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you, forever the hope in my heart. I'm saying. 
away by the power of this love today. Oh, it's all because of you, Jesus. All because of your love, your great sacrifice for us in our place. is from 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. Here is your example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned, not ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Yes. Shame, I hear my mom. 
Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. In his words, I know with all my heart. His words have paid my ransom. Welcome to Good Friday. What's good about it, you might be wondering. We're in the middle of a global pandemic that's unfolding beyond our eyes. There's thousands of people at risk of dying. There's thousands already that have died in this country and all over the world. And 20 centuries ago, one man died, nailed to a piece of wood, unfairly, unjustly. Why would we celebrate that? Why not skip to the end? You know, I think Christians often skip to the end of the story. We don't like to pause and wait at Jesus' death. We prefer to think of him as resurrected and newly made alive and descended on high, which he is. But my feeling is that if we just brush past his death and make our gospel slightly more palatable and say, Jesus died and then quickly he was risen again and descended on high, then we risk losing something that's very, very important from the gospel. Now, I'm going to be reading to you from... 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and I'm going to be pausing for a little bit longer to see if I can take in Jesus Christ on that cross. Now, my first thought is that the very fact that Jesus died is the single most appalling thing that has ever happened in the whole of the universe, that his perfect, spotless righteousness could be cruelly put to death in such a way is dreadful. But what am I to do with it? Is it just, that's very sad, now we'll move on again? Or is there something in this that is for us to help us? Could God not have clicked his fingers and made it all go away? Couldn't he do that today? Couldn't he just make coronavirus not a problem for humanity? I believe he could. However, what is he really doing? And why? People often like to presume upon God. We like to think that because we know of what he's done before, that we can predict his future behaviour. Time and again, the Bible tells us that that is mistaken. To presume upon God, to try and think you've got him figured out, is a huge mistake. We're going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 right now, and I'm going to be starting from verse 5. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let there be light to shine out of the darkness, has now shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in jars of clay, to know what the surpassing power that belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We are always carrying in our bodies the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus can also be manifested in our bodies. You see that without the death of Jesus, the life of Jesus can't come. Without the darkness of that day of crucifixion, the bright light will never be understood by people. When we look up at the night sky and we see those sparkling dots that are up there in the big bluish emptiness, we realise that without that blackness, we wouldn't even know what stars were. In the daytime, I can't even see the stars because the light is so overwhelming, I can't even know that there is such a thing as a star. But at night, when things get really dark, that is when those 
piercing, bright lights of beauty start to shine through. Now, I've got some things to say, but I don't want to take forever to say them, because the Bible says that where words are many, sin is not absent. And one of the biggest problems for the preacher is how do you talk for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30, 40, 50 minutes without filling it full of sinful exaggeration or prolixity? I'm going to try and avoid that. So what I'm going to do is point you to a couple of things that I think will help you today. First of all, we don't proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ. The world is not helped by us doing too much self-analysis, self-referencing, helping ourselves. The thing that the world needs most is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's why the guy who wrote this letter wrote somewhere else. He said, I desire to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. The point is that God's beautiful light has shone in the darkness and Good Friday sets the scene for the most dreadful darkness ever to have unfolded upon the world. Now, I know that was a long time ago and our minds like to invent this story where everything consistently gets better. You know, civilization advances, technology advances, and medicine advances, and hopefully each generation is slightly better off and slightly happier and lives slightly longer than the previous one. But the darkness that unfolded at Calvary all those years ago is still here. It's in the suffering of humanity today. The gospel is not some simple magic formula that will make everything go right again when you clap your hands a couple of times or say a couple of prayers. Mortality is an enormously difficult problem. And we have to trust in Jesus, who knew what he was doing on that cross. He counted that cost and he paid it. He looked at the cup of the wrath of God and he measured it out and he drank it to the last drop. For us, not so that he would take away all forms of suffering for all time for everybody who would ever live thereafter, but so that he could do that one day. And there will be a day when all suffering and all memory of pain and sadness and loss are going to be gone forever. When he finally defeats death and the enemy and, and makes an end of all sin for all time, that is going to be a day to truly celebrate. But until that day, I feel like I must keep the cross in the middle, in the centre, at the front, because it is the place where everything began to change. Now, look at what he says in verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has now shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I wonder, wherever you are, can you imagine his face? There are some really good songs about it. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. When he died, he understood. And he still did it. He understood that it was going to hurt the whole time he was doing it. That he was going to be paying a price that no mortal person could ever have paid. And to deliver a people to heaven forever was going to cost him everything. And some people like to speak from experience a little bit too much. They like to say, ah yes, but we know that he didn't really die, or we know that he only died for a couple of minutes, or we know that he only died for a little while, or we know that he only did it because he knew he was going to wake up again in a day and a half. Well, I don't think so. I think being human means you don't get to be so sure. I think that when Jesus came to be a part of us, to be one of us, to participate in our humanity, he came to share all of those uncertainties, all of those doubts, even the temptations. He came to identify with us, to share what we have, so that he could give us something that he has. Sonship, immortality, everlasting life, union with God the Father. Now, if that all sounds like technical theology, I'm sorry, but without the cross, there is no bright light at the end of the tunnel. There is no way out. There is no escape from 
the mortality and all the problems that beset the world. We're stuck. And so we need that cross to be in the centre stage. And we need to look at his face and see the love that he had for us when he laid down his life and gave up his spirit to the Father. Now, I am only human. I am a jar of clay. But Paul says here, the Bible teaches me here, that there is treasure in there. And not treasure just because I'm generally quite a nice guy. But supernatural treasure. Treasure that I didn't start with. Treasure that is God's own presence here in my life. Christianity is not mainly a moral thing. It's not something we do to try and live a little tidier. Christianity is when we, as mortal humans, open our hearts and receive in us the true light and life of God that comes into our spirits supernaturally, changing us, transforming us, saving us. We need there to be a saviour who can come into the deepest and darkest places to deliver that for us. Otherwise, we don't have any other hope. There's no other way. Now, Paul experienced a lot of opposition while he was starting his whole apostolic ministry. When he wrote this letter, he was probably already in prison or under armed guard pretty well all the time. Paul knew what it meant to be alone. He knew what it meant to suffer. And later in this letter, he gives this huge long list of all the things that he's had to suffer as an apostle. Because some people are saying, well, he wasn't one of Jesus's 12, so he doesn't really count. He had to defend himself against claims like that a lot. And he knew what it meant to be treated unfairly. Now, I am relatively young, relatively healthy. I live in a relatively wealthy country. And so I might consider that myself, I haven't actually been that unfortunate so far. I mean, compared to with the great majority of humanity, I'm one of the richest, happiest, healthiest people who've ever even walked on this earth. What do I know of suffering? Well, let me tell you, I understand what it feels like to be completely desperate, to have no power over sinful desires, to have absolutely no way out of a mess that I created for myself. When I was saved, when I walked with God, when I started to change and to open my heart and to welcome him in, I was lost too. The difference is that some of that loss doesn't always look like much on the outside. So many Christians will spend this Easter saying, Sir, you have a lovely life. You have a great job and a great home and you've got all the bells and whistles. You're only just missing the icing on the cake or the cherry on top. But that's not the gospel. The gospel says money and healthiness and happiness as we humans experience it can only ever give us such a fleeting temporary glimpse of joy and hope and peace and love that they almost have no value. Today it is time to open our hearts and allow the pure, severe, difficult message of the cross of Jesus Christ to come and touch us again, to glimpse his face, to understand why he died, who killed him and why. To see that God is doing more in this earth other than just improving humanity's lot step by step with better legislation. To understand that Jesus came to lay down his life, to give us his spirit, to save us for all eternity. Now, I pray that you, this Easter, today, this Good Friday, that you would know what it meant to have the death of Jesus in your body and the life of Jesus also in your body. I pray that you would be able to understand those two things as being completely and beautifully connected. I pray that the stars would shine through the darkness of today, the weeping of today, the loss of today, and that Jesus Christ himself would be Lord over your life through your willingness to say, yes, let that count for me. Standing here at the foot of the cross, looking up 
at the crucified Lord to say, let that count for more. Please join me as we pray. Lord, I thank you that you did not stay on a cloud far away, somewhere out there beyond the universe, but you came down to share with us, to belong with us, to be rejected by us, and to save us. Please deliver your people. Save us, Lord Jesus. Save us from sin. Save us from evil. Deliver us from evil, O oh Lord, so that we can know the freedom and the love and the hope and the joy that come from knowing Jesus Christ, our oh Lord. Amen. That was a great word from Pete. As we come to the end of our time together today, I'm just going to sing one last song, a beautiful song about the cross. It's when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Let's sing it together with a grateful heart, a heart filled with gratitude and thankfulness.
Father, we thank you once again, once again. Father, I pray that the same love that sent your only Son for us to die in our place would fill us up right now. That your Holy Spirit would enter our homes, would enter our hearts and our lives. Father, fill us up one more time. Lord, as we spend the rest of the weekend just reflecting on this, and fixing our eyes on Jesus and this beautiful, amazing sacrifice, Father, we pray that you would speak to us, you'd whisper into our hearts beautiful truths about you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit. And about us and what this means to us and how we are affected by this today, even during these hard times. For your glory's sake and for your kingdom's sake, we ask you, Father, through your son's precious name. Amen. So God bless you. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you again Sunday morning, Easter Sunday. We won't just be celebrating the cross and the death on that day. We will in fact be celebrating the resurrection. We'll see you then Sunday 10.30 on YouTube. God bless you.